community of Member 2 is known today by some as the Jewel of Cape Breton, but not too long ago, the sad story of how they were once ignored and left on the outskirts of town is not so well known. So I want to thank you very, very much. Dan Christmas has been part of Member 2 all his life. He has been instrumental in moving the issues of the Mi'kmaq forward through the work with the Union of Nova Scotia Indians. He agreed to leave his longtime position to work for his own community as one of those who came home. Today, he is the senior advisor and community liaison for Member 2, and in many ways, the storyteller. Member 2 has, a, has both a good story and also a bad story. Um, I guess the bad story is that uh, this wasn't our original home. Um, Member 2 originally was along the water in Sydney Harbour. Um, there's records, for instance, that our community was there as early as the 1800s, and the, the, the community grew along the harbour. The town of Sydney grew prosperous. Our community also shared in their prosperity. A lot of people worked, did a lot of business. Over the years, um, our little community down by the harbour was doing okay. But the price of that was that Sydney also grew because of coal and steel, that as the town grew, uh, the residents believed that we were in the way of development, that we were right at the entrance of this new thriving town. There was a movement underway to, uh, to have the community relocated. And of course, um, our members felt very, very strongly that this is our home, this is where we've always been, and we're not moving. So despite repeated attempts to persuade the community to move, the community refused. And so uh, there was certain residents here from Sydney who uh, took up the cause of removing the community. And they went so far as even go to Parliament and to change the Indian Act so that it could apply in this situation. And this is the only situation that we know of in all of Canada where a First Nation community was forcibly removed from its home and had to go. So in 1916, um, the court at the time issued the order and it took 10 years, mind you, to find a new home. But our sad history is that uh, the residents in this area back in the early 1900s did not want us and wanted us to move far away from town and uh, basically be not seen and not heard. Uh, the irony is now that uh, here in uh, 2010, Member 2 has become one of the key economic drivers of this whole area. And um, geographically now, we're right smack dead in the center of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. And uh, as time has gone along, we've become more and more prosperous and more independent. And uh, where we were back in the 1900s, uh, we're there again. So it's a, it's a sad story, but at the same time has a happy ending. Well, it wasn't easy. Um, in fact, I think the community had to hit rock bottom first before we really appreciated and um, had the motivation to, uh, to really make things better for the community. Um, about 15 years ago, um, the community here, I think, uh, bottomed out. Um, I think our revenues at the time were something like $4 million a year. I think 99.99% .99 of that was from the federal government. Our deficit at the time was $1 million. And um, for all intents and purposes, the community was bankrupt and we were on the verge of bouncing uh, payroll and also bouncing social, social payments. And uh, looking back, uh, we didn't really have um, one, the resources, we have very limited resources, uh, all dependent on government revenues, and uh, the demands were huge. And so uh, it took some time, I think, for us to recognize that that was an untenable situation, it wasn't sustainable. And so um, uh, I feel sorry for communities who think that uh, their only way to get by in this world is to rely solely on government. And if you rely solely on government, I think, in my mind, that's the formula for poverty. The chief here, Chief Terry Paul, um, he knew he had to do something different. The status quo just couldn't go on. And so uh, he felt the first thing that had to be done was to uh, get control of the finances, to try to live within our meager means. We shouldn't be living this way, you know, or continuing to live this way. And, and the way we lived was that we were completely dependent on the uh, federal government for our livelihood. 
which is which is not a good way for any people to uh, to live. So we decided to uh, make positive changes and looked at uh, why we were where we were. He believed that in order to build the community, he needed the people from the community to come home and help build it together. He looked within his own for the expertise and knowledge to move forward out of a life of dependency. We realized that um, we didn't have the right people working for us. and We didn't have the people that uh, were well educated and uh, the first thing we did is that we, we, we took a, a look at ourselves and, and we looked around as to what band members have the qualities that we need in order for us to help us and lead us, I guess, to, um, to a more prosperous uh, community. So, so we did that and we found some people and uh, some were working in Toronto in the, in the law offices there right in Bay Street. Some were working in British Columbia. Uh, New Brunswick and some other provinces and some people were here like you know so um, we we got a number of them on board and uh, I, I talked to uh, uh, all of them and asked if they would come back you know and uh, in fact our CEO that came back uh, he uh, came back uh, accepting a, a less salary so that that certainly uh, told me that he was committed to uh, helping us and uh, move further. He went out and recruited a lawyer here from the community, uh, Byrne Christmas, who was a, a corporate lawyer on Bay Street in Toronto, basically asking a community member to come home to uh, begin the process of rebuilding the community, but with very little to offer him. And so uh, Byrne basically left uh, a very good practice, a law practice, in which he received very good pay and uh, took a major pay cut and moved him and his family to member two uh, around 1995, I think and uh, he began the process of changing how this community looked after his business. Uh, the first step he did was to uh, stop the bleeding. Um, he began the process of um, encouraging the community and its council to live with it within its means. And it was difficult. Uh, I remember those years. I, I still wasn't working for the community at the time, but during those early years it was very, very painful. And. Um, uh, I remember many, many community members coming to us and saying, this is terrible, uh, this is too much. We uh, decided that uh, we need to make uh, serious changes if we were going to improve uh, you know, the, the living conditions of our people in Memertu and uh, work towards uh, being less dependent on the government. So at, at that time, too, there was a number of things happening. We were winning court cases, and uh, so the government was listening, beginning to listen a, a, a lot more to us, to uh, Mi'kmaq communities. We, we took advantage of that. One of the things that we worked on uh, right away was the, uh, was the gaming, and uh, the province was uh, willing to negotiate gaming agreements uh, uh, with, uh, with the communities, and there were several others that uh, had already made those arrangements, and, they were telling us that uh, they were making really good revenues uh, out, of, out of that, uh, you know, out of the gaming. So, so we negotiated with the province and uh, got a deal that we felt, uh, uh, you know, satisfied with at the time, you know, and uh, we were able to uh, almost immediately uh, start making really good money uh, in gaming. So that helped us to uh, uh, do more programs. The council persevered, Chief Terry persevered, um, eventually the bleeding stopped, uh, we got control of our deficit, and by 2000, I remember Byrne was very, very proud, uh, showing his audited financial statements that we had zero uh, deficit, we, we, had a, we had a balanced budget, and this was the first time in a long time that remember whose finances were uh, out of the deficit. As spectacular as the economic success story is, what is really significant is the way in which it was achieved. Their successful transformation was done by using the best natural resources and assets they had, their people, and Mi'kmaq values. Um, people, people, people. Um, remember to an urban First Nation, and because of that, we have access to facilities, including education facilities. Uh, Cape Breton University is a very short distance away. 
uh, Nova Scotia Community College, Marconi campus, is very short distance away. So over the years, our community members uh, took advantage of those two institutions. And um, before this economic boom, we already had a pool of very educated, um, very talented young people. And as the years went by, since there were no jobs in Member 2, they went everywhere else for jobs. I can name a whole group of people um, during the 90s and, uh, who came back to Member 2, um, who were health directors, who were education directors, who were financial managers, um, who were uh, already educated, uh, many of them professionals, uh, who had experience, and we were all brought back to the community. And that gave us, I think, the critical mass and the leadership and the experience and the talent to be able to take the community and go forward. So the top three are people, people, people. You get the right people, they'll do the right things and make sure that we're in the right direction. So the first part of the strategy was, was sound, responsible fiscal management. Uh, and it was difficult. And um, I think that's one of the first steps the community has to take to, uh, to rebuild. But the second step, I think, is even more critical. And that was uh, developing a plan on how to rebuild the economy of our community. And uh, it wasn't taken lightly, it was, uh, it was well thought out, well planned. Uh, we definitely asked our community uh, how we wanted to go forward with that. And uh, uh, the two key, um, not motivators, but, but the two key sparks to that development was one was gaming, of all things, and one was the fishery. Uh, the fishery story is well known. Uh, in 1999, Donald Marshall Jr., um, a fisher from this community, uh, won a major court case in the Supreme Court of Canada that bears his name today. And that opened a door for many First Nation communities, including Member 2, to get involved more heavily in the fishing industry. And uh, throughout uh, 2000, 2001, uh, we began that process of, uh, of developing a fleet of vessels here in Member 2, um, buying licenses, um, uh, buying a lot of gear, training a lot of fishermen from the community. And uh, over the years now, over 10 years since, uh, we've developed significant revenues and employment and uh, a lot of experience and know-how about the fishing industry. Uh, the second key spark was, uh, was the gaming industry. And so one deal that we had in Member 2, for instance, uh, came about about the year 2000. And um, it was a very, a very controversial issue here. Um, and uh, we decided that we would take it to the community for a vote. And the community defeated it. So, the, um, and, and for good reason, if you look back in hindsight, uh, it was built on a very private entrepreneur mod model where uh, casinos or gaming machines would be uh, established. And, um, profits would go to individuals, not to community. So after some thought, uh, we, we worked the, the deal. Uh, we said no, uh, we respect that. And uh, a second vote took place and it, uh, it passed by a huge majority. And so now the, if you look around the community, we have uh, uh, five different uh, gaming buildings and uh, each of them are owned by the community where the profits go to the community. And uh, between those two sparks, uh, that started the road for economic development. So today, uh, our budget uh, today is around $65 million. Uh, uh, our government revenues are probably around a 20% range. 80% uh, of our revenues are our own, uh, earned on ourselves by our, our own people. Uh, we employ over 500 people now, 60% um, of which are from the community. Uh, back in 1999, some 10 years ago, uh, we employed maybe 50 people. So to go from 50 to 500 uh, has been a huge, a huge benefit, not only for ourselves as a community, but also for people around. Well, the two concerns uh, about 10 years ago, one was uh, on the fishing side. Uh, the big controversy was about rights, um, whether or not this game agreement uh, really was something about Aboriginal treaty rights. And as you, can, as you know, the Marshall case originated here in Member 2, so the community is very astute about its rights. And uh, there's a lot of controversy that these agreements, these interim agreements proposed by the government, was not about rights. It was more about convenience. And that was controversial. 
Uh, on the gaming side, the whole issue was the social cost of gaming. Um, will the gaming agreements result in a lot of people in the communities, uh, in our community, uh, resulting in disruptive family lives? And would it result in addictions? Would it result in people um, spending their paychecks on gaming machines? So the social aspect of it was a huge worry and a huge concern. Uh, today, uh, the vast majority of our customers are not from the community. Actually, 95% of our clientele is outside the community. Although community members use it, and yes, we have our share of social problems, it is not pervasive and it's not uh, a huge issue. In fact, over the years, our Gaming Commission has put in steps uh, to help people, not just Mi'kmaq people, for any, any customer that's involved in gaming to be socially responsible in its gaming practices. So we've, we've introduced those in our, gaming, in our gaming machines here as well. We were able to do a lot more things to um, build more houses than what was allocated uh, by the government. Able to pave our roads, uh, put sidewalks on them, uh, develop other businesses that we felt uh, would help our community prosper. We also constructed a, a trade and convention center and you know we didn't realize how important and how uh, how much people would accept this facility it, it's like it's not only our community member too that has a, has like a, has accepted this uh, this particular building but uh, the surrounding area you know and that Cape Breton and uh, they're very impressed with uh, what we had built and uh, in fact, some of it call it the jewel of uh, Cape Breton. So we're really proud of that. And uh, it is things like that, you know, that uh, uh, we were able to do uh, with, with the money that we earned. And uh, it helped uh, create more jobs, more revenues for, for our people and, uh, to do, and for us to do more things. And uh, that even the beginning of uh, lessening that dependence on the government. So we, we've built uh, a number of facilities uh, since that time, uh, such as the entertainment center, where really it's just a fancy word for a, a bingo hall. But, uh, you know, it has its niche. Uh, people in Cape Breton love their bingos. So we were able to uh, create that and uh, give that atmosphere. And we really made good money. You know, we started making profits in the third year of that building. But at the same time, we're able to honestly say to the communities, to the outside, you know, that we contribute uh, like over half a million dollars a year to uh, charities, you know, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, the Kiwanis, the Kingsmen, uh, you know, the minor hockey, you know, Member 2 Recreation itself has a bingo there, you know, and, and uh, the Knights of Columbus are there. So there's, there's, these, these are service organizations, but they're charities and uh, we help, uh, we, we help by uh, them earning those kind of dollars, so that's our contribution towards uh, charities in the area. Uh, most of the businesses, well actually all of the businesses that you see here in the business park are all owned by the community. Uh, our chief and council um, developed, developed these businesses. The convention center here, for instance, is a community-owned facility. Um, and over the last 10 years, uh, we developed an economic base here in Member 2. And, and now we're attracting thousands of people every day to member to. Now this has given the opportunity for small business owners, indiv individual small, small business owners here in the community, a chance uh, to develop and grow their own businesses. Uh, one of the big challenges here in member to is because we have very limited land, there's very little space where individuals can establish their own businesses. So we came up with the idea of building uh, basically a strip mall. Uh, we call it the Member 2 Business Center, but it's basically a strip mall. And uh, we're going to lease out uh, spaces in the strip mall for community people to establish their own businesses. Now, um, in order to make the business center work, we had to bring in some anchor tenants. So we have uh, some, uh, some leases with some very, very established businesses from the outside uh, who will help pay the bills and uh, also bring business, but uh, it's primarily for um, entrepreneurs in the community to uh, give them the opportunity and the space to open their small business. So uh, hopefully that part of the community will, will also benefit and, and cash in from the, uh, the huge customer traffic that Member 2 has generated over the years. Chief Terry Paul has been leading his community for over 26 years. 
He is a residential school survivor and is no stranger to living in poverty during his early childhood as he grew up in the Mi'kmaq community of Membertu. He believes strongly in building the community together with the involvement and consensus of the people he serves. I always had two items on my platform, uh, right from you know the first time I ran to now, which is you know 13 terms later, you know, 26 years later, another election coming up in June. You know that uh, I've always given the same mandate, and that's being fair and being honest. You know, and people really like that. You know, Chief Terry's all about doing things the right way. He's. Uh, uh, he exemplifies, um, for instance, the, the value of fairness. He's very, very fair with people. No matter who they are in the community, he'll treat them fairly. And when you respect people that way, respect comes back to you. And so here in Member 2, we're very respectful of the leadership here. Um, yes, we don't always agree, but at least when we disagree, we do it in a respectful way. Uh, we make sure that we listen to people. The best way to do it is to be fair to people, you know, and uh, they seen that. And they seen that I, I wasn't uh, favoring one group or one family or one person over another. I was fair to everybody. Traditional Mi'kmaq leadership was always uh, very inclusive. It was always involving everyone. It was always uh, not autocratic. You were more persuasive more than autocratic. Um, when you went to make decisions, you wanted to make sure you had everyone involved and as much as possible you tried to find a consensus that everyone could agree upon. And I think Chief Terry does that remarkably well. Um, he's able to achieve that consensus in difficult times. And at the end of the day, all of us are you know, going in the same direction and grateful that we are and happy to do that same direction. And uh, I think that's a very... Uh, uh, it's a very unique aspect of leadership that uh, I think Aboriginal people uh, have a strength uh, to give to others. I think it's worked because I'm still here and uh, I've been able to do uh, uh, many things. Uh, I, and the beauty of being a chief that you, uh, you, you get the benefits, you get the accolades of uh, what many people do as a team and uh, work with you. And uh, I'm so very proud of uh, the people that work for me. Uh, you know, at the management level and the staff, so uh, so we always um, constantly check ourselves and to ensure that uh, you know we're on the same page and that we we are doing the same, uh, the right things for our people. But the one thing I have noticed about our council that it will always strive to do what's best for the community, not what is best for the individual or for the family. Sometimes we always try to focus on what is best for the community, and. That's always been our underlying theme or our motivation, our value, our ethic. I guess that's always been there in the community and I, I hope and pray that it will always stay that way, that we're always thinking about the community first. Um, and I think that has played a huge role in our community's confidence in our leadership. They know that uh, we're not there for um, picking favorites or, or or, or out for anything, for any personal gain. We really want to exemplify that we're there for the community and we want to do things that are community first. And I often think that uh, we were very fortunate that that leadership style uh, tapped into a lot of traditional uh, values, that uh, there's an underlying reservoir of Mi'kmaq values about how you treat people and how you do business. and. Uh, uh, I think looking for out for the collective good is an Aboriginal traditional value. Um, respecting and treating everyone the same and fair is a traditional value that no matter how old you are or how young you are, whether you're a, a woman, whether you're um, unemployed, whether you're sick or you're disabled or um, having mental problems or family problems or social ills, um, we all strive to treat everyone equal and the same. And um, I agree that probably without us knowing it, but we were probably tapping into that reservoir of, of old traditional values. About 20 years ago, um, we were a community of roughly 300 people. Um, today, uh, our community is 1,200 people. So we've gone through a lot of growth. I mean, 
I, I remember seeing a report in uh, 1981 saying that there were some 56 homes in Member 2. Now there's over 330 homes in Member 2. Um, our land base is very, very limited, so um, it's been a real challenge to manage the growth in the community, and not only in terms of size, but also how do we continue to deliver all these programs and services? How do we continue to make opportunities available for small businesses or for jobs or employment or training? So um, growth is one of our biggest challenges here in Member 2, and uh, it's not easy when you're growing fast. It's pretty hard to keep ahead of it, so that's one of our biggest challenges here. Uh, I think one of the strengths of Aboriginal people, including the Mi'kmaq, has always been their, uh, what I think, their adaptive strategies. That they're always able to find a way how to adapt to an environment no matter what it is. I used to be amazed, for instance, in my younger days when we were stuck in a welfare economy. How incredibly adaptive some of our people were in ensuring that the, that, that welfare economy was maximized to the most. And, but. I think that's part of who we are as, as people. Uh, I'm always amazed at our ingen ingenuity, our, our determination, our will. Um, we can uh, practically adapt to anything. When economic uh, prosperity came to this area, uh, we were expendable. Um, we were asked to move away from sharing that economic prosperity. But when hard times came to Cape Breton, uh, it was Member 2, and people will tell you in, around here, it was Member 2 who brought the economic prosperity back to the island and this part of Cape Breton. And so today, um, Member 2 has become a, a destination for many people. We employ a lot of people from the municipality. Uh, we contribute heavily to the economic success uh, of this part of uh, Cape Breton. And uh, I think we've become one of the economic drivers, ironically, of this area that uh, in the past we were thought we were an economic uh, dead weight. So uh, uh, some of the elders tell us that uh, maybe that was for a reason, maybe that was for a purpose. And sometimes in hindsight, they may be right. Maybe all that was for a reason, all that was for a purpose. And, uh, and now, uh, today, uh, we're benefiting, I think, from a very unfortunate situation, but now uh, uh, we have certainly become beneficiaries of uh, of uh, a lot of economic prosperity and uh, maybe we need to forgive those as well.